Super. Hi, I'm Britta Como for the, those that don't know me. Um, I'm a real estate appraiser, um, designated appraiser. And today I'm just going to share with you a little bit about what appraise, appraisers look for in appraisals and how to boost your value before we show up. Um, our first question um, when we start our process in the appraisal world is the highest and best use of the property. We want to know if it's physically possible, legally possible, financially feasible, and maximally productive. And we um, do this by looking into the size and shape of the property, um, the zoning bylaws and official plans, um, often conservation as well as um, an issue, or um, uh, we have to consider that. Is it financially viable and profitable? And does the properties, um, is the what we're you're going to use it for what the property is being used for is it the property's best value and potential um so one of other key factors is the location in determining the value um, the proximity to amenities and transportation is there public transportation available are schools close by is it a desirable neighborhood some neighborhoods have been um were desirable at the beginning and then through transitioning, they're not as desirable now. Um, you know, airports have been built around them, highways have been built around them, industrial properties, um, things like that. So now perhaps it's not as much of a desirable location anymore. We look into the zoning and official plan, as I mentioned, um, which is a really important factor to know um, the property value of your whichever property you're looking at um, you can help decide on the value so like I appraised a property and um, it just looked like your typical residential property and when you searched up the zoning there was development oh, potential so you would want to be able to educate your seller or buyer that there's probably more value in your this property with being not just being residential and that it has some future development potential or vice versa. If you're helping a seller and he's he or she is saying, hey, my property is worth the same thing down as down the road, but it ends up that down the road that property has a higher use because it's in a secondary plan slated for development where your um, buyer seller that is in a rural property and does not have any near future development plans. So these are some things to consider. Um, we also can, once we get to the property, these are the, some of the things we take into account. Um, we take in the physical characters of the dwelling in any out buildings, the interior and exterior finishes, um, heating and cooling, the quality of construction, the ages of roof and windows, um, types of utilities such as a gas furnace versus electric baseboards, luxury finishes versus a builder's standard grade finish and recent upgrades. And then overall maintenance. As you can see, I walked into a property and um, there's a huge water stain, um, paint peeling, so there's Obviously some issues, if that could be resolved before the appraiser walks in, then that would be a benefit to your buyer and sellers. We also consider the size and layout. Um, you know, a dysfunctional layout is um, a negative and, um, you know, a nice flowing property is a positive for sure. We look at the overall utility of how many bedrooms, bathrooms, um, the function of the overall place and a finished basement versus a crawl space. Um, upgrades and features we look at would be renovated kitchens, bathrooms, windows, roofs, furnace, etc. you know, appliances. We also consider over improved and under approved. If there's a homeowner who is just in love with high end material like um, gold leaf faucets that may be over improved for your neighborhood um, and they'll not get their money out 
down the road. We then um, we go into the market analysis and we look at the um, comparables in the market. From a lender's perspective, they only want to know um, what has sold in the last 90 days. If there's been any extended days on market over 90 days, lenders kind of get a little um, sensitive with those um, um, comparables. They want to see more recent comparables as we know the market changes quite quickly right now. What happened 90 days ago may not be what's happening today. And um, it helps your buyers to understand that, well, or your sellers, um, that if a property that sold six months ago that was much higher, why an appraiser can't use it is because there's most likely more recent sales and the lenders will, the underwriters do call appraisers to find out why um, older sales were used. And that happens on a regular basis. So if a buyer or seller is wondering why you're not using something that sold quite some time ago, it's because lenders um, need it under 90 days. Then we adjust the comparables um, for the differences between the subject and the comparable and such factors as location, lot size, age and condition, um, the utility of the house, how many uh, bedrooms and bathrooms and upgrades we consider. Then um, the final valuation is gathered from the inspection the market analysis, the comparative analysis, and adjustments to be determined. Um, some of the, so just on the, during the market analysis and the comparables and adjustments, we do consider location. Um, so in that perspective, if there's um, a location where, like a new subdivision um, and most properties are going for under a million, we would do a certain type of law adjustment or location adjustment, but that would not be the same um, like value number. So dollar value number as a high end property. So if you got more estate residential, you know, properties going over two millions, there would be definitely a different consideration in how much you would um, adjust on a per square foot rate or um, your lot value. A lot value might go for, you know, three, four hundred thousand in a standard subdivision. However, a standard estate subdivision, the lot values could really change quite quickly up to a million dollars. So um, we would take into consideration those factors as well. Um, the final appraisal report, um, the scope of the appraisal, the neighborhood, the description, um, all comes into the factor, the highest and best use. And then how to boost your property value. By knowing what the appraisers are looking for, realtors can um, price homes for sale and help your buyers. Setting realistic expectations with clients and potentially reduce days on market, such as maximally productive or physically productive possible. Um, preparing sellers with knowledge and advice clients on how to improve their homes before listings repairs and up updates to positively impact the home's value and always considering over-improvement or under-improvement and transitioning neighborhoods. Um, knowing appraisal requirements can potentially avoid delays and deals falling through. Realtors who understand appraisal criteria can help their clients anticipate potential issues and take proactive steps to address them ahead of time such as um, additions uh, within a lot coverage. So by that, I would mean uh, a house who maybe had, um, you know, a 7,500 square foot lot and they decided to um, finish a detached garage. So the lot coverage in the original house probably was within the zoning bylaw. So let's say, the lot, like I said, the lot coverage Lot was 7,500 square feet. Um, the allowable coverage is 30%. And that allows you a 
a house of 2,250 square feet. So if now they've had that for their original house, but finished a detached garage, adding an extra thousand um, square feet, now appraisers would check in if there's a minor variance on that property or if it's legally permissible because it's now exceeding the lot coverage. And lenders will want to know this as they may not lend on that if it's not legally permissible. So those are some other things to consider. And then when negotiating on behalf of your buyers and clients by knowing what appraisers look for, you can ne negotiate effectively for your buyers. Um, you know, if they're wanting to go over asking price, then um, making sure that the appraised value comes in to satisfy the lenders as lenders won't um, give out extra money, right? So if it's if it's the appraised value is five hundred thousand, and the buyers paid a hundred thousand over, then the buyers have to come up with a difference, right? And that's about it for me today. Any questions? So good, Britta. Uh, someone has their hand up. Mary, go ahead. Yeah, Britt, I have two questions for you. Actually, the first one is. If your house has vacant lots on the street that have been vacant, they're owned, but they're vacant for, you know, empty for 30 years, is that a negative or a positive to the other people's values? And my second question is, if the municipality has approved garden suites, in-law suites, accessory outbuildings, is that a positive or a negative? Um, so your first question, it just depends on, again, location, you know, some of this rural subdivisions um, that have been in the works for, you know, 10 plus more years, and it's not a negative because it's expected, whereas maybe in town, some people may wonder why there's empty lots, but for the most part, it's it's neutral. Um, I wouldn't really worry about um, an empty lot when I'm appraising a property. The second question would be, uh, it's a positive, if, especially if it's approved by the, uh, the township, then those are all positive because people can um, add value by doing the in-law suites or an apartment, um, whatever, right? So it adds value and possibly income for that homeowner. So that would be a positive, so long it's legally possible. Right. Okay, thank you. Would you be concerned about somebody building something that is, um, if it's not... Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, if somebody, somebody's going to build something that's so... Um, I, I don't know what the word is, um, so... An addition? Well, even that, if you're um, if it's an empty lot. Oh, okay. If you're not regulated and it doesn't fit into the community, that's what I'm trying to say. So maybe somebody's going to build a ma mausoleum next door to a contemporary I, house. Again, it has to be legal, right? If it's not a legally uh, legal use, then they can't build it. But if they're allowed to build it, and like if it's an in transition period, right, there's a lot of transitioning areas where um, then it can be a negative because there's maybe other people that won't appreciate such um, an improvement going up in their neighborhood, right? So, um, so long the zoning allows for it, then yes, it could be considered a negative. It's like... Um, small older like century homes there's a lot of post-war homes and then all of a sudden somebody's building a massive you know four thousand square foot mausoleum house type thing it's a house though um it's allowed the lot coverage allows it but now it stands out like a sore thumb but that's transitioning right so it's upsetting for the people with the smaller homes, but eventually they'll all go that way, right? Um, for example, this neighborhood in Richmond Hill, South um, South End, kind of Highway 7 and Young, 
they were all little bungalows, you know, a hundred years old. And now they're most of them have been transitioned over the last 20 years into, you know, multi-million estate homes, right? So at first the neighborhood disapproves, but as it continues and continues, it's now a um, more estate subdivision, right? So things like that. So, and so long as it's legally um, possible, then yes, you upset some people and you make some people happy. <laughs> I also wanted to mention for anyone um, wondering where you get some of your cost informations to put numbers on, on TREP, there's a um, spot where you go to the commercial section and there's a rough guide um, to construction and it has individual costs of what it would cost to put in a bathroom, what it would cost to build a two-story home. So that's available to everyone on TREB who has access to TREB and it's called Rough Guide to Construction, which is also very helpful if you're looking to price out individual parts. That's awesome. That might actually be helpful for what Jake is asking. Um, he put in the chat, if you find no comparables, a property within 90 to 180 days, what are your next steps in finding a value? And he's asking in luxury properties, let's say two to four million are very unique and differ a lot from comparables. How would you determine accurate uh, accurate uh, value? Is that per square foot? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So the first question was? Um, if you find no comparables um, on a property within 90 to 180 days, what are your next steps to find the value? Um, we look... Um, further outside of the neighborhood to find similar homes first. So if, um, you know, it's a try to stay within one to two kilometers, but if that doesn't work, I'll go as far as 10 kilometers. So, you know, um, Georgina, let's say South Keswick versus North Keswick, I would do that. Um, Sutton versus South Keswick, probably not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so first I expand my neighborhood area and then I go back into time um, as far back as I have to and then explain why and then make time adjustments. So then that's where time adjustments come in. Um, and sometimes it's also just a conversation, like if it's for lending purposes or something, if a buyer's bought a unique home, um, it's having a conversation with the lender to educate them what's going on and giving them the information and allowing them to participate a little bit and saying, okay, yeah, we can accept these types of comparables and not these. I do anyways, not everyone goes that far, but um, to, to make sure that we can bring the deal together, right? And then for the luxury, um, finding the, the values, um, it's, a little bit of everything. So it's your rough guide to construction. It's just keeping informed with local um, contractors and um, just, you know, knowing from even looking at different price values when you're, you're out and about. Um, so yeah, we're just, we would um, go into just luxury, um, like what it would cost to build a luxury home, right? So contractors and um, cost factors, like the rough guide to, there's also Marshall and Swift. That's another cost estimator. So we use those cost estimators to help us come up with the numbers. So good. Um, we have a few more questions in the chat. Um, Melanie is asking, is there a dollar amount per square foot Things used for new build custom homes? A dollar amount per square foot um, yes. for custom homes? That that takes a little research looking into other custom homes. So um, one way of doing that is um, extracting the land value. So you take the, the sale of a comparable um, 1 million, let's say, and the square footage and you divide it and then you get a per square foot rate. 
And then you do that with some other custom homes that I've sold. And then you kind of get an average of what custom homes are selling for on a per square foot rate. So we do some math on that one because custom homes are so unique that it's not like be, you have the cost estimators to help you on a per square foot. You have contractors to help you. And then as well, just doing some math work on finding other comparables and just doing a square foot rate and see where you fall in between that. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Perfect. Um, and then Tifa has a question. In your opinion, has the cost to build proof been updated on TREP to keep up with inflation? Um, yeah, I I have um, kept up with the rough guide to construction quite some time over the years. So they definitely in um, update it year to year. It's still on the low end, I find, um, for what's actually happening. I don't think that it's quite um, where it should be, but it's it's at least a bottom end for your cost. Um, I had just pulled it up, but I can share it with people. I can put it, I can email it to you, SG, and then everyone can have a little yep. copy of that. Perfect, okay, that'd be great. Right? And then you can just see um, what they're at saying I think I just looked at it. So a two-story standard house, no bells and whistles, was like $358 a square foot. So it's not too off, but um, I'm sure if you talk to a local contractor, they would not disagree. <laughs> um, and then Jake is asking, what about those non-conforming, very large, overly luxurious properties for the area? Do you factor in a law of diminishing returns? Um, yes and no, just depending. It's unique to, to the situations, right? So if I know that there's other properties that have coming up in the works to be built like that, and I know the neighborhood is transitioning, um, I kind of just work with that. And, but yeah, there's a... If I can't find anything in the neighborhood, yes, then we do the diminishing returns for sure. Wonderful. Um, someone, Anna, you have your hand up. Go ahead. I oh, just wanted to check. Brita, if let's say the client is not satisfied with the appraisal report, do they have the right to order the second opinion appraisal report? Oh, of course. Again, it's yeah, absolutely. From another um, appraisal, and it happens all the time. And let's say if they come with a huge difference or with a difference in both, what would the lender take into consideration? Um, I that's up to the lender, right? Um, I think that's more of a mortgage lender um question. I don't. I can't speak on the behalf as to how they decide which one they they want to go with. Um, yeah, that's up to a lender, unfortunately, right? It's no different than us as agents putting one value on and then the, another agent coming along and putting a different value on, right? It's an opinion at the end of the day. Very good. Awesome. Anyone else before we release you off into the wild? Any other questions for Britta while we have her here? Amazing. Well, this was so great. So many amazing questions. So much great information from you, Britta. We're so appreciative of you gifting us your time this morning and sharing this information with everyone. Uh, we'll be sending out a replay and all... So um, the info that Britta will send me and her contact information as well. So if anyone wants to reach out to Britta directly, you can. And other than that, make incredible things happen today, everyone. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.